Good morning and afternoon. My name is Cheryl Lee, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Reaching, Engaging, and Retaining Women in HIV Care conference call. Ms. Amanda, or sorry, Ms. Amanda Hoppingwin, you may begin your conference, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Amanda Hopping Wynn, Associate Director here at the National Abandoned Infants Assistance Resource Center, located at the University of California in Berkeley. We are funded by the Children's Bureau, and our message here at AIA is to enhance the quality of social and health services delivered to children and their families affected by substance abuse and or HIV by providing quality training, information, and resources to the professionals who work directly with these families. Today, I'm excited to welcome you to Reaching, Engaging, and Retaining Women in HIV Care, What We Know, Don't Know, and Need to Resolve, presented by Dr. Victoria Cargill. Dr. Cargill completed her medical education at Boston University School of Medicine, her residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital of Harvard University, receiving many awards for clinical excellence in compassionate care. After completing an Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship in Clinical Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, she was recruited to Case Western Reserve University, serving as teacher, clinician, and researcher, achieving the rank of Professor of Medicine, the second African-American woman to do so in the history of the medical school. In 1998, she was recruited by Dr. William Paul to the Office of AIDS Research, where she serves as the Director of Minority Research and Clinical Studies. In that role, she works with a number of groups, including academicians, community groups, advocates, researchers, and federal colleagues. In addition to reviewing the NIH HIV research portfolio with respect to racial and ethnic minorities and health disparities, she's a practicing physician, caring for people living with HIV infection in Southeast Washington, D.C., and teaches community-based research and community engagement at the University of Pennsylvania Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. Dr. Cargill, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm so excited to, to hear what you have to tell us. Um, just a few notes to webinar participants before we get started. At, at different moments during this presentation, we're going to open up all lines for discussion. Um, at that point, you will be unmuted, but we'll give you a heads up before that happens. Also, if you have any questions while Dr. Cargill is speaking, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box, which is located in the lower right-hand portion of your screen, and make sure to send them to me, Amanda Hopping Wynn, and I will um, address them to Dr. Cargill when, when she pauses. So with that, I'd like to turn the call over to Dr. Cargill. Well, good morning and good afternoon. Um, it's afternoon for me here uh, in Bethesda. It's really a pleasure to join you. And today I think it's going to be, I hope, a chance for us to sit back, relax, and have a chance to have a conversation together about some of the challenges in reaching, engaging, and retaining women in HIV care. I don't have any financial disclosures to make. I will not be presenting anything off-label. I do need to note uh, that because I am a federal employee, that there are times that I may express my personal opinion based on my clinical experience or a relationship I've had with a patient that I'm presenting, but these are my opinions and don't represent the National Institutes of Health or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services position. So I think we've gotten the formal information out of the way. What I'd like to do today is to talk about a few things, um, and I'd like to sort of take the pastor's approach. I'd like to tell you what I'm going to talk about, talk about it, then tell you what I talked about, and hopefully that will keep us all together. I'd like to discuss the barriers to reaching and engaging as well as retaining women in HIV treatment uh, to really begin to talk about some of these patterns of behavior that indicate treatment and care fatigue, which is increasing. Unfortunately, as we have more options, it seems people are also becoming more tired of being in care. To look at some of the data linking care and missing care that links this to HIV disease progression outcomes. To review and identify some evidence-based methods for retaining women in care, as well as where our gaps are in the knowledge base and, of course, to tie this all together with some examples from the real world, which is what makes it the most relevant. So this picture is one that always brings me back to why I do what I do, and it's a rhetorical question, of course. Now that we have treatment, why aren't you in care? And, and this is a common source of frustration, I think, for providers, for um, front-line uh, workers, that we have more available to us, and yet we see 
so much disease progression, morbidity, and in unfortunately some cases unnecessary mortality because people are not able to remain in care. Just some of the facts, uh, about 1 in 139 women will be diagnosed with HIV infection, and if we look at particular subgroups, that's 1 in 32 black women or women of African descent, 1 in 106 um, Hispanic or Latina women. But I do want to draw your attention to Native women, and it's one of the reasons I think it's so important when we look at the HIV statistics. We don't just look at the case numbers, but we look at the rates, because if we look at rates, those numbers are then standardized per 100,000 of the population, and it allows us to compare much more easily across population groups. And this is one item I, I want to make sure that we keep on our radar because we often don't talk about this population group, and that is that Native American women had three times the rate of HIV infection of white women, and yet they're less than 1% of our U.S. population of uh, women, so we need to keep that in mind. And there is some good news that for the first time, the new HIV infections in black women declined by 21% when we look back from 2008 to 2010. And this is really the very first time this has happened. So we know that we can achieve some important gains, but it does take a great deal of work. Unfortunately, we talk about adolescents in HIV infection. Young people that are ages 13 to 29 are almost 40% of all the new HIV infections, 39% to be exact, and of those, 65% engaged in males, were males who engaged in sexual behavior with other males. For those who were ages 20 to 24, they had the highest number and rate of HIV diagnoses in 2009. And I think we need to think about that for a minute because at 20 to 24, that means that their life course has been set. They will forever require HIV care and management at that young age. And also to put this in context, remember that age of sexual debut remains about 15 in this country with about 46% of high school youth reporting sexual intercourse. So we've got our work cut out for us. We can't talk about care without talking about the cascade of care. Uh, this is an update from the original work that Lit Gardner presented, which I'm going to show you shortly. But in 2009, if we take a look at HIV care in the United States, there are approximately 1.148 million HIV-infected people living in the U.S. And of those, about 18% or 207,000 roughly were completely unaware of their HIV diagnosis. This is an estimate. Overall, it is estimated that about 37% of individuals are retained in care. And I'll come back to why I bolded that and put an asterisk in a minute. And of all the U.S. HIV-infected individuals, looking at a number of different surveillance studies, about a quarter of them achieved viral suppression, meaning that their viral loads were below the limits of detection. And the highest rates of retention in um, care and in viral replication suppression were actually in female injection drug users and heterosexuals. Now let's unpack this slide for a minute. We know that roughly 18 to 20 percent of people are completely unaware of their HIV diagnosis and this is based upon studies of people who end up coming into care in retrospective examinations. But let's now look at that 37 percent who are retained in care. Before we get very excited about that, please remember that for the purpose of Hall's study, and the citation is at the bottom, they define being retained in care as coming in for care at least one time in a year. And I think many of us who provide HIV care would not think that showing up one time in a calendar year for care would be sufficient care. But for the purposes of their study, that's how they defined it. And the second is to take a look at that very last bullet, that the highest rates of retention and viral replication suppression were in female injection drug users and heterosexuals. And I point that out because, unfortunately, we still hear practitioners saying that they will withhold treatment from people who use drugs because they insist first that they get their lives together. I don't mean to imply that people who engage in drug use behavior can do not have chaotic lives, but that does not mean it's a blanket generalization. And I know in my own practice, some of my most together patients are patients who have very busy lives but also manage their drug use. So I just point that out um, as we have written in the treatment guidelines Simply being an injection drug user is not reason for withholding care, and I think this Hall's data helps support that. 
So this is Lit Gardner's spectrum of HIV care and engagement that he's um, become known for, and the, really the course that people walk through. They first start out at the left side of the slide being HIV unaware. There's a subset that then are aware, but they have either chosen to not be in care or have felt that they don't really wish to have care in their life at that point in time. From that, you have some who then do get some medical care, but they're not consistently in care. It's more episodic, often related to a discrete episode of a problem. Then there are those who enter care, but then they drop out of care. Uh, there are those who clearly choose to engage only in episodic care, and then finally those who are fully engaged in care. And so that really is a spectrum, and how do we move people through that or bypass some of these steps and hopefully engage them fully from the outset. So why would we even care about um, this engagement in care? Because there are benefits clearly to being in care. Um, Michael Mugavero and his colleagues at UAB have demonstrated very clearly that being in care is associated. I mean, it's sort of a no-brainer, but unfortunately some of these things we have to look at large data sets to say, see, this really does make a point, that there is increased immune competence, and they do this they assess this by measuring the higher CD4 count, as well as much better viral suppression and a marked reduction in disease progression if the linkage to care is made early in the disease course. So better outcomes, living longer, living better, and might I point out the public health benefit. When there is increased viral suppression, we know there is better control of HIV replication in the genital space, and therefore there's a public health benefit with decreased risk of transmission. Not to zero, but it's better than no control. There's also another study that Gardner and colleagues did in six clinics um, in their cities of Boston, Birmingham, Alabama, Boston, Massachusetts, Brooklyn, New York, Houston, Texas, and Miami, Florida. And there they're able to demonstrate that 73% of their patients with more than one visit to the clinic had a viral load that was suppressed. And suppressed used the older definition of suppression, which was less than 400 copies per ml. Some of you may be in sites where you're now using less than 50 or less than 40. And suppression, as I mentioned, does indeed confer a public health benefit because transmission risk is decreased. So again, if we're saying 37 to 40% of HIV-infected individuals are retained in care, and again, that in care using that one visit a year at least standard, that still means 60% of people are not in care. So it would be important to know what predicts people either linking late to care or, as we'll talk later on, just not linking at all. And the first point to note is that linkage to care really begins at counseling and testing. It doesn't begin at the care site. I think some of our earlier studies, if you go back and look at them, we were focusing on what happens once the person shows up and what's happened at that end. But there have been data now more recently to suggest that linkage to care really begins right at the counseling and testing site. And uh, Garland and colleagues were able to look at a group of individuals who tested positive, but they just didn't come into care for at least 5 to 19 months and identified three key places where there were difficulties. Either in the first, they'd had a negative experience with a counseling, testing, referral service center, and they just didn't want to deal with it. Or second, they had gotten either misinformation or inadequate information at the time of their testing, and therefore they just pushed off getting linked to care. Or third, and I think this is a lesson for all of us, it was a passive referral or was an inadequate referral. And that, too, led to delayed linkage to care. And what do I mean by a passive referral? Um, you can go to this clinic down the street here. I think their name is such and so. Or, yeah, let me write this name down for you, and you can give that, go to try there, or go give that a call. That has not worked well. So now what are some of these barriers? Let's break this down a little further, looking at reaching and engaging women in HIV care. Let's first look at the obvious ones. Obviously, HIV infection doesn't occur alone, or as I tell the medical students, and I had one student in particular who said, I just don't understand why people would want to come to this clinic, and I had to remind her, I don't know anybody that gets up in the morning and says, I have nothing else to do today. I think I'll go out and get HIV infection. It occurs in the context of people's lives. And so HIV incurs in a number of contexts, whether it's individuals who are financially comfortable, but often and more often than not, people have experienced a number of difficulties. And 
bring that past with them into this experience, whether it be poverty or these extremism people who go to these funerals and carry on in such a way or discrimination, or this sign, which was taken, a picture taken by a colleague of mine, a church in the South, and I don't know if you can see it clearly, but it says, Tsunami AIDS War. Do you hear me now, God? And then underneath it says, Welcome. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I think if I were traveling somewhere and feeling the need to try and go someplace for spiritual solace because I was wrestling with my HIV infection, I doubt that I'd put the blinker on to turn in there. So what are some of the factors that impact people presenting for care, particularly women in presenting for care? And please note that these are really only at two levels. There are multiple levels. There's also community-level factors and societal or familial-level factors, which I'll touch on at the end of this slide. So there can be individual level uh, reasons that people either don't present for care or that certainly figures into what one of my patients called her um, disclosure and care-seeking calculus, which I thought was a very creative way to talk about that. And these have been looked at again and again, uh, particularly by experienced investigators like Valverde. Fear of disclosure. If I go for care, I have to tell somebody. Um, as one person told me that I took care of early on in his course, he said, you knowing that I have HIV infection is one person too many. People don't trust the medical system. Many of our patients already come from marginalized groups or individuals have had poor experience with the system, and that was when they were feeling in some sort of control. Now they have yet one more factor which already gives them a certain amount of discomfort, shame, fear, mistrust, and being much more vulnerable, and then to have to go back into that system. Shame. Um, I might have to tell you what I've done. I may have issues around that. Why do I have to talk about this? Or just simply, you know, I've got 400 things on my list today and getting HIV care is not number one to 300, a lack of motivation. There are system-level issues. Uh, it's difficult to navigate the health system uh, for for many people. It's difficult for me. I have a child that has a, a serious illness, and I can't tell you how much I've struggled. And I'm a provider and, and knew the the individuals involved in his care, and it was still difficult, so it's even more difficult for people who are mistrustful or may not have engaged the system very much. Often um, an HIV diagnosis may come in the context of a contact with the criminal justice system and having to navigate that system as well as HIV infection. Not having health insurance or having other financial constraints all can impact upon women's decision-making around getting care. And then there are also... Community level factors in my community, there may be as an example, someone may say for for women in my community, we don't share these things outside of the family, so I cannot go and seek care, or this might get back to my family, and I bring shame or disgrace to them or to myself. Um, there may be familial level issues, and we'll get to this a little bit later on or partner level issues. If I go and do this, and I've got to go talk to my partner and there's there's an underlying theme of some violence going on between us, and I don't wish to bring this up anymore. So there are a number of things that can negatively impact presentation for care. And yet there's also additional barriers that are superimposed upon this. For example, poverty, and it's been demonstrated that HIV-positive patients were more likely to seek preventive dental care if they took the financial barriers away, or if clients were more satisfied with their care, they were more likely to return and engage in care. For that last one, let me point out that that was true in subsequent studies regardless of the um, economic status of the client, but it was much more heavily weighted for patients that were a racial and ethnic minority. If they were satisfied with the care, felt the provider engaged with them, they were more likely to return. And that superseded knowledge that the provider was, quote, an expert. Uh, it's not just on the woman's side, the patient's side. There are provider issues. There have been several studies of primary care providers demonstrating that some didn't test because they were afraid they would then have to respond to a positive test result. Um, the CDC has tried to address this by providing seminars and engagement tools for providers to help them feel comfortable providing an answer to a test result. But this has been demonstrated to be an issue. Some primary care providers didn't want to test the patient because they felt this would undermine their relationship with the patient. The patient would feel, oh, you're testing me because this is a negative. You must think something about me that's not positive, and therefore, why are you doing this, and I won't come back to you. Uh, the other 
piece of this and looking at providers is providers have a very interesting take on in these studies who did and did not need testing. And routinely, they didn't test teenagers, although some of that is confounded by legal issues. But on the other end, didn't test the elderly, making some assumptions about risk. I know that my colleague Bill Short and I did a Medscape review, and in it we talked about the need to test and talk with elderly patients uh, defined as over 60. Uh, may I say parenthetically that the older I get, the um, more I wish the definition of elderly to get pushed further back. But it was interesting to us that as we raise this issue and provide the data for it, much of the feedback from that presentation came from providers who said they just simply never thought about asking their patients over 60 or over 65 about risk behaviors for HIV infection, which I think shows a blind spot um, for many of us. Now, personal history also certainly impacts care-seeking behavior and retention. And I want to make sure that I differentiate for you. There's a difference between trauma and violence in this slide. So let's start on the left-hand side with trauma. And that really has to do with the past. And Roberts and colleagues demonstrated very early on in, in the epidemic and then went back and demonstrated again that about a quarter to, in some series, more than three quarters of women living with HIV have experienced abuse in their past. And that abuse could be physical, sexual, emotional, or some combination of them. The other personal history that a woman brings with her that is so important is depression. Depression has repeatedly been shown to be a major predictor of dropping out of care and of non-adherence and even mortality. There have been studies looking at large series of women and controlling for missed visits, controlling for non-adherence, and controlling for length of time in clinical care. And even when you control for that, the women who are depressed died more often. So this is a major flag. That's why I've started that we have to keep in mind. Certainly active substance abuse has been consistently associated with poor adherence and outcomes, particularly in individuals whose lives are chaotic, and therefore it's not so much the substance abuse, but all the chaos that goes along with that doesn't allow them to consistently engage or consistently take their medications. Now to the right hand of the slide, but now we're talking about violence in this data set, we're talking about violence as a result of their HIV diagnosis that women reported that they've come to physical harm since they've tested positive. And then certainly a past experience that many women with HIV infection have had very difficult past with a number of different issues that surface, and this for them is one more thing to have to deal with. So based on that, there are some predictors of individuals who are going to fail to link to care. And uh, Michael Magavero again took a look at this, and it was in his group at the University of Alabama. But because we're talking about this, not surprisingly, female, racial or ethnic minority, either lacked having insurance or had public insurance with no gap filler or fail-safe insurance, and people who were non-local residents, meaning they went to get testing out of where they lived out of fear, and therefore it was either difficult for them or they were not being linked to a care site near them. So I'd like to take a minute to walk you through one case, and I would just say I don't believe in cooked cases. I think you can smell them a mile away. These cases are real. I've changed the names of individuals and tried to change some of the uh, information without losing the point of the case so that I could maintain their privacy. But I think that they... Um, raise some of the issues that I'm speaking about and will give us a chance to talk about them. So we'll call this first case Stella's case, and I titled it, I Never Expected You to Have HIV for a Reason I Think You'll Understand. And I remember when she came into the clinic, because uh, when she came into the clinic, her screaming and crying announced her long before I knew that she was my patient. She was, uh, at the time I met her, 38 years old. She's a white female, and she worked as a medical transcriptionist, and that means she basically printed up the dictations at a very large, very well-known um, Midwestern tertiary care hospital. She had one son at the time from her prior marriage, and she had told us that her husband had died from hepatitis because he was an active injection drug user, and she lived in the state of New Jersey. In fact, it was his injection drug use that terminated the marriage. 
she had um, was now in a four-year relationship with a truck driver that she would only say had a quick temper and had found herself pregnant with a second child and was actually quite excited about it and had requested an HIV test because when she was in the doctor's, her OBGYN's waiting room, she read an article that talked about the importance of women now knowing their HIV status because of preventing mother-to-child transmission. So she asked her doctor about it when she was called in, and he told her, no, I don't think you need an HIV test because you're white. And she continued to push him that she felt she needed an HIV test. And when the HIV test was administered and returned positive, he called her at her job at this large hospital clinic. And I don't know if you've ever seen where transcriptionists work, but they work in what's called a transcriptionist pool where you sit behind a little partition with a glass. You have essentially zero privacy. And she told us he called her at work with the test results um, saying, you know, you're HIV positive and don't worry, I'll still take care of you. But, hmm, you know, I've just never treated a white woman with HIV before. So as you can imagine, when she comes into the clinic, she's completely hysterical. In fact, some of my other patients comfort her. And I actually saw her early because one of my patients surrendered his time slot to her because he was so outraged when he heard the story. And in the exam room, she had a number of questions, of course, from, you know, what happened with this testing to now I need to get my son tested to what am I going to do about telling my partner because, you know, he has this temper and he's going to start screaming at me and saying it's my fault. And um, she, as she talked with me, she started to piece it together and I could see the different parts of her past husband's story coming together. And she said to me, finally, I don't think he died of hepatitis. And she wanted to um, really go back and talk with her mother-in-law. She still has a relationship with her to some extent, of course, through her son. But she just really wasn't sure to start. And she had all kinds of battling emotions, which makes complete sense. So here's one for you. Um, What do you think is the main reason for her unwillingness to confront her former mother-in-law? Do you think it was fear, uh, stigma? Uh, shame, or maybe um, all the above. And if we could unmute the line so people could um, let me know what they're thinking about this case, that would be terrific. So does anyone want to volunteer what they think is going on with Stella? Can I just confirm that we have unmuted the lines? Um, all lines are unmuted now. If you'd like to mute your line, please do so by pressing star six. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure, I would like to take a stab at it. Sure, thanks. I, I think it's all of the above. That's Agreed. right. Do, who else agrees? I do. Yeah. 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 I do. Sorry, right. was, was it sure. all of the above? Yeah. yeah. All of the above. Excellent. Yes, all of the above. Great. Now, can I just take a minute here? What are people's reaction to what her physician did? I think it was heartless, inconsiderate, and uh, biased. Exactly. Anyone else? Because it does not, um, uh, HIV AIDS is not color specific. Unfortunately, everyone is open up to it. In my opinion, this is Debbie Rock. I, I somewhat want to use the word ignorant. I think he was innocently ignorant of how to address her or confidentiality just for the very reasons that he said. He's never done it before. It's sad, but that's exactly what happened. Right. Anyone else? Well, let me just tell you before we go on to the slide what happened. I I tend to agree with you. I had a conversation with this um, gentleman, I use the term advisedly, and tried to express to him that uh, this was a difficult way to present the diagnosis to someone. And his reaction to me was, I can read the statistics, Dr. Cargill, and the bulk of women in this country with HIV are black, so why would I expect a white woman to walk in my office with it? And at that point, I figured the conversation only had one way to go, and it was probably down. Um, Unfortunately, she did not listened to us and was sufficiently anxious about her son that she asked him to conduct the test for her son, 
rather than go to the pediatrician because she was, as you can imagine, unwilling to let this go out without her having some control. So she did, and sadly, the same physician didn't learn from the first experience and turned around and called her again at her job to tell her her son was positive. And at that point, she finally listened to us, and we removed her from his practice. Um, but the answer is all of the above, and so I'll continue if we can um, go ahead and remute the lines, and we'll speak again in a little bit, okay? All lines are now muted. Thank you. So, you know, as everyone had mentioned, it was all the above, and certainly it's a deadly combination. When people are afraid, they won't disclose, uh, which makes it difficult to not only treat, but it facilitates HIV transmission. Repeatedly, studies and sometimes these horrible cases that have come out show that non-disclosure um, can happen for a number of reasons, but people get hurt. Uh, there's legal consequences in the case of that awful case in Texas where that man killed the woman because she not only was getting rid of him, but then put in his face she had HIV infection. Uh, it's just it's a disaster. Uh, it makes people not want to present for HIV care because they're afraid to have to share this information with someone. They also deny to themselves, which not only impedes their presentation to care, but it really harms their retention and care. I took care of a woman who told me every single time she saw me, she hated me to the core. And then she'd say, don't take it personally, but I just hate seeing you because I don't think about having this until I have to come here and see you. And as you can predict, she dropped out of care. And we were we could not ever engage her for any long periods of time because she just couldn't stand it. And eventually she succumbed to her infection. Stigma is another part of this uh, deadly combination. And there's all different types, but they all as you know, impact care seeking, whether it's self stigma, people impose these feelings on themselves that they're either inferior, they're worthless, or something's wrong with them because this happened to them, or felt stigma that they perceive that you know that people have a perception as a group towards someone and often this is associated with acting out. And then enacted stigma where there's an action which is fueled by stigma that's discriminatory. And when my brother in law uh, unfortunately acquired his HIV infection, I was appalled that um, my mother-in-law, when she had a large Thanksgiving dinner, called herself being gracious, but she made the point that he was the only one who got the paper plate, thus outing him to everybody. So in the end, the type of stigma really is irrelevant. The outcome is the same, and they lead to shame, and shame interferes with consistent care. And even the UN has come to recognize this. You know, uh, General Ban Ki Moon has been quoted as saying, and you can see it there, I'm not going to read it for you, but the points are that it is really a huge barrier to public action. It's the reason why so many people put off getting care and the reason why the epidemic continues to devastate societies around the world. Uh, we don't have a corner on the stigma market, and neither does um, anyone else. Uh, and this is a quote from a patient of mine I've been caring for for the last uh, four years. She's been living with HIV infection for six years. So if you can see by her age, she's 19 now. That's correct. She was infected at 13. I met her at 14. Uh, you don't have to hit me to wound me. Your look, your manner, the way you speak to me, it already tells me if you have judged me or not. And in the case for this young woman, she was heavily stigmatized enough that she was homeschooled. Now, there's another phenomenon that impacts women and something that you will not see published yet in the literature but is well recognized. I'm sure you're seeing it yourselves, and that's something we call treatment fatigue. Uh, treatment fatigue has been happening for some time across the United States and I would dare say across resource-rich uh, areas that have HIV care, such as Canada, Europe, uh, this has been discussed at a number of Women's Research Institute retreats where providers gathered from a number of cities. I was present at two of them, but I heard from my colleagues in Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, Miami. We all reported the same thing. And these tend to be women. They don't have to be, but often are between the ages of 20 to 40 who just appear to give up on care. It's not been well documented yet. Uh, certainly it's not something you could do a randomized trial on, but it appears to be widespread and linked to a number of factors. And let's just talk through some of these. Because these women usually have children, they often have a history of um, chaotic lives, and there are some behavior patterns that 
as we talk together, we all are seeing in women who have this treatment fatigue. Their children are often in the care of a relative, usually the child's grandmother or their mother, or at the request, often at the request of child care services because there's been a problem. Uh, women have a current or a prior history of substance abuse, partner abuse, a mental health disorder, or all of these. They've had intermittent linkage to health care despite a series of, aggress- of interventions which have been increasingly aggressive to get them into care and to hold them into care. Repeated issues with not adherence, which in and by itself is not enough, but accompanied by the expressions of frustration with HIV treatment, such as, you know, I'm tired of having this, you know, I'm sick of coming here. Um, And when we were talking about this as a group and we were ticking off these things, one of my colleagues who works at Johns Hopkins said to me, oh, you forgot the big one. No one will miss me when I'm gone. And we all nodded, recognizing that that's a very common expression of fatalism in these women. So let me show you how this plays out in another case. And again, this is another patient of mine. And this is actually a young woman who's a nursing assistant. So she does have some healthcare knowledge. And I raise that because I want to not allow us to go down the road of, well, if they had healthcare information, maybe they wouldn't act this way. No, this is this is past information. It's where people live, unfortunately. So Aisha... Um, was 27 at the time I first encountered her, and she tested positive back in 1996. She is a, a nursing assistant, and she actually comes to clinic, interestingly, all the time, straight from work in her um, nursing scrubs. She has been really difficult to retain in care. She's been in and out of care since 1996. She lost custody of all of her children um, due to drug use, uh, mainly her drug use, and she had some aberrant behavior that raised concerns of child neglect. I'll also point out that she had four children, but she lost one child to crib death. That was a child that she learned her HIV status uh, when she went to get prenatal care. She had a set of twins after that. One child, the male child of those twins, and these twins were, by the way, born uh, seronegative, but that child uh, died of sickle cell crisis, and then she had a subsequent child. Uh, and by that point, she was demonstrating such aberrant behavior. I'm not sure that any of us wouldn't have aberrant behavior, that kind of um, awful history. Uh, and so at delivery, that child was removed and placed with her mother. She was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and placed on antipsychotic Haldol, but she never returned for follow-up mental health care, and as it turns out, she never took the medicines. Um, She did come into clinic uh, a couple of times for some asthma management issues, and it was noted that she was not adherent to medicine. It was a long conversation we had, uh, and she was willing, she expressed a willingness to try a new combination regimen. But she also had some concerns about taking her medicine because she had a new boyfriend. Excuse me, she didn't want her new boyfriend to know about her HIV diagnosis. So now we have some more time to talk through this one. What are your next steps, or maybe at least some of them? Would you, A, engage the patient about her relationship to learn more about its dynamics, including, you know, is there any violence going on here? Um, B, talk with her about her thoughts on HIV medications and some perceptions of how they work or don't work. Uh, Assess her mental health, since we know that she's had a history of some hallucinations and then the diagnosis was changed to a schizoaffective disorder. Sounds like that might be questionable because she was given an antipsychotic. And uh, Or D, identify other supports in her network. Do all of it or do something else entirely. So if we could um, unmute the phones again so people have a chance to talk about this case, that'd be great. All lines are now unmuted. Thank you. Um, some thoughts? Uh, hey, uh, Hattie Bull. Um, I really think that it would be helpful for her if all of the ones, the steps that are listed, mm-hmm. were utilized during her care. Uh, okay. Because she, she would definitely need some support Uh if she can find that among her net network and the mental health problem uh seems to be evident 
and that's an issue that needs to be uh, taken into account as well. Mm-hmm. I just feel that A, B, C, and D will be helpful to uh, the young lady. All right. Thank you. Someone else? Uh, this is Mary Beth Davis Dyer. I, I would um I would start with finding out what her goals of you know, coming in today were. Uh in terms of, you know, what, what does she want to get out of um being there. If she's just presenting for um asthma relief but has some concerns about her HIV to you know, to just talk about where she's at and trying to meet her where she's at. Uh, it's been my experience that very often um, clients feel overwhelmed with um, a routine of you know all the things we want to talk to them about that that are important, um, but that we're not pacing at their level, mm-hmm. and and um, it, they leave overwhelmed, and and that can um, that can cause them to not come back rather than you know really just kind of taking our time and pacing with their pace to see, you know, yes, addressing those things in its time. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let me just go back to the slide. She came in um, for asthma management, and I made a note of the fact because our charts flagged not adherence, and that began our conversation. Um, Katrina, I see you have your hand up. Is that correct? Um, Am I reading this right? No. No, oh. I didn't do that. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm not able to really talk because I'm in the office and I'm not able to talk, so I'm sorry. That's, that's fine. I just didn't want to ignore someone who was trying to get my attention. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Okay, well, you've you've all made great points, and I completely agree that, you know, we, we sometimes just come at people full gum blasters, you know, it's like HIV is on our list, but it's not the first thing on theirs, and so we have to slow down. I think that was so well said and and back up. On the other hand, I can also understand there's some pressures. This young woman, when she showed up, her chart was flagged for not only non-adherence, but as she talked to me, I could see she had thrush, so I felt I really had some pressure to get the discussion moving. So I'm going to go ahead and, and go forward if we can mute the lines again, please. So Can we the, the lines, please. So the um option as many of you identified was again um all of the above. So there were multiple needs and approaches for this young woman and the first thing uh, I did in talking with her is I tried to determine if you know, she was actively psychotic, and that is one way that you can approach the patient. Certainly engaging the patient about her relationship to screen for violence because if she has a solid relationship network, that can be leveraged to try and improve adherence or engage the patient. Or, unfortunately, if there are issues at home that would take her away from care, be it violence or fear or thinking that people are going to put her out, that can be an issue as well. So it helps to get all that out, if at all possible. And then what are her thoughts and perceptions about HIV medications and how they work? And this is not just an idle conversation. It's because depending upon how women perceive and our patients perceive their medicines and how they're going to work, that can influence a number of things from how they're going to take them to, unfortunately, There have been some demonstrations that if there's a belief that um, taking antiretroviral therapy, the ART, can reduce HIV transmission, and the person also is not that concerned about unsafe behavior to begin with, then the risk of high-risk behavior goes up. So it's not enough to just say, oh, if I give this person therapy, you know, they're going to go out and engage in high-risk behavior. It's really what people think about what ART can do in terms of the transmission, and how concerned they are about risky behavior to begin with. But that combination can be problematic. So when I saw her, I did uh, talk not with her, but she came with her mother, which was very helpful. Uh, And she was clearly not psychotic, but she clearly did have a number of pressing mental health issues. She had not disclosed this information to the partner, 
and in fact shared that when she had disclosed to a prior individual she was dating and interested in having a more intimate relationship with about her HIV status, the person, as she said, kicked me to the curb. And so she clearly was no longer interested because she held that up as the outcome of what happens when you disclose, so my way is better. And it was difficult to try and engage her at that point. We offered her a number of options, including that we could just have a partner notification done blindly, not necessarily linking to her, and she wanted no business with it. So we said, how about if you just come back and talk to us, and if you like, you can be willing to have the partner come. She said no. She subsequently changed her mind and said, well, you know what, maybe I will go ahead and have the um, contact tracers notify him. Um, And we scheduled a follow-up visit. The health tracers called me first to say that it was a bad address. She never showed up. We had multiple attempts to try and contact the patient, and they all failed because not only did her phone get cut off so that she could no longer receive any messaging from us, and by the way, I routinely give my, uh, there's a cell phone number I give to all my patients so that I can text them and, and vice versa. We tried to get in touch with her through her address, she had moved. There was no foreign address. Work, she had left, and mom said that she had just disappeared as she has been wont to do in the past. So she came in six months later, just dropped in, and I happened to have an opening. And when she walked in, I didn't even recognize her. She was 65 pounds lighter than when I had seen her before. She had gone from the 170s to like 110, 105, and this young woman is five foot nine inches tall, so she was thin. Uh, she was 104. Her breathing was so fast and shallow, and she looked blue. And her mother came in with her and to tell me that the boyfriend looked sick. And so she was suspicious that he was either injecting drugs or maybe, as she said, maybe he's got the virus too, and he didn't tell her. Uh, when I came out to talk to her in the waiting room to bring her back, she tried to walk and was so weak, I just gave up. And I literally carried her. I remember this. I carried her like I would carry one of my own children. Uh, and she had thrush again, but she also had blisters on her nose and inside her nose that went down to her lips, which were consistent with herpes simplex, and just trying to get her to stand up. She had terrible pain uh, grabbing her left side. I mean, it was really quite tragic. I just remember this. I think this will be one of those clinic visits that will always be burned into my brain because it was such a stark change from just six months earlier. So that brings us to talk a little bit about disease progression and superinfection. HIV superinfection is not new. It was first reported by Rick Hecht and colleagues about 15 years ago in San Francisco when he first documented this occurring in one of his male HIV-infected patients. Uh, Since that time, there have been multiple reports of superinfection occurring in a number of settings, and it really requires the suspicion that this could be happening. But here are some clues. The person may have been doing well, and then there's an unexplained clinical crash. They seem to be deteriorating. They were well-controlled on their antiretrovirals before, and it can't be just quickly checked off to, oh, they're not taking their pills, or, oh, they blew us off from care. And there's no underlying opportunistic infection like um, candida or yeast of the esophagus or cytomegalovirus of the brain that can be explained. And in this patient, who, by the way, I had to admit to the hospital, and she had both pneumocystis crenii pneumonia, AIDS pneumonia, PCP. She had mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, which indicates that her immune system, I would have guessed before I even saw her labs, her CD4 count had gone from 180 when I last saw her to zero. And, in fact, when I had the blood work done, her blood resistance profile for her uh, HIV showed a tremendous shift so that things that she was sensitive to before now are completely gone. And finally, more sophisticated studies prove what I suspected, and that was she yet acquired another strain of HIV which was resistant to much of what we had been giving her. So that, And it was subsequently determined that her boyfriend was also infected. Now, the irony in all of this is that superinfection has been looked at in women. And so if we just look at women and how their immune responses um, change, they seem to broaden their immune response to this new invader of HIV-1, if you will, and have a kind of boosted response. But unfortunately, this doesn't do anything in terms of preventing disease progression. It's just sort of an interesting finding along the way. But they continue to progress, just as others were who are now battling two different strains of HIV infection. 
So if we know that we have all these challenges, what can we do to successfully get women to care? Because clearly it's not just getting them into care, it's retaining them in care. HRSA has done a report with the John Snow Institute demonstrating that the first thing you have to do is really look at it from the patient's perspective. And this should not be novel, but unfortunately uh, it is. It's important to think about it, looking at it, as we say in our practice, from the minute you walk in the door, what does the practice look like from someone who's walking through the door as the person who needs care, not as the provider? You know, we have to be there. But how does it appear for them? So is the environment woman-centered? Is it responsive, meaning that there can be some flexible in the hours? Is there child care on site? Is there a multidisciplinary team? So it's not that paper referral or passive referral I referred to earlier. But if there's food insecurity, fine. You know, in our practice, Tanisha is down the hall. We can get you plugged in. If it turns out that someone's having difficulties with um you know, housing, there's a person there on site that can help with that. Uh, using peer educators and peer navigators as paid and valuable members of the team is often quite helpful, especially navigators to help work that healthcare system and coordination between medical and social service support teams. Um, and as I said, again, health system navigation because it is difficult. Um, I can think of one patient that presented to the emergency room with a huge mass in her neck and someone didn't have a problem sticking a needle in it to biopsy at 2 o'clock in the morning, but no one could seem to find the time to return her phone calls to give her the information or she was passed from one person to another. I'm the health care provider and chose to take this on and help her, and it took me an hour to get to the bottom of it, and still I, got no, I didn't get sufficient information, so it can be terribly frustrating. Certainly facilitating linkage and retention to care is going to be important, and Lit Gardner was the one who did the continuum of care I showed you early on, has come back around and demonstrated that it's the act of referring to care that makes a huge difference, such as linking into care a specific name, a specific date, a specific time, an active case management referral, or actually going with the person if in cases where that's possible, or having someone that can navigate and attend with them to make sure that they can get to care. Now, HRSA had... Um, what they have, their special projects of national significance study that showed that if you are accompanied by the tester who made the appointment, that even worked even better, but not everyone is set up to do that, and I recognize that. So the other side of it is then what happens if people don't follow up or they miss their visits? And this was, again, Hall's abstract. It's not yet a published paper. I'll be waiting to see if this meets peer review standards. But this was uh, done in several cities, including New York. And it was interesting to see that about a third of those people who were thought to have dropped out did return to care after they had gotten contacted again. So I think, to me, the moral of that story is then let's make sure that even though someone drops out, we continue to go after them because there may be other issues going on with them that have prevented them from coming into care. And I think this last bullet really spoke to me that the biggest reason that people didn't come back was because they felt good. And this will always be our challenge, I think, with HIV infection. You know, I like the analogy that we have used many times that people have HIV infection have a bucket full of sand, but there's a hole in the bottom of it. And so as you walk around in the beginning, you don't notice because the sand still looks pretty high, but when it starts to really fall through, then it gets their attention. But unfortunately, at that point, people feel bad. So when someone already feels okay, the motivation for getting into care has to be pitched differently than just, quote, unquote, disease control. And that's where I think we have to be creative. Some other things that will facilitate linking um, women and retaining them in care is having culturally competent and female-friendly care, which means that many women with HIV infection already have a past of experiences have not been pleasant, to say the least. And so if you've already experienced a certain amount of discrimination or racism or difficulty in the care, you just expect it to get worse. And so having respectful care that can either ease that fear and preferably promote a bond with the providers, that clearly impacts returning to care. And again, it was demonstrated not just in women, but particularly in racial and ethnic populations. If they felt they had established a bond with the provider and that they were more to the provider than just a patient, that the provider really got that they had a number of things going on in their life and were at least respectful of that, people were much more likely to return to care. Dr. Cargill, can I jump in for just a moment? We had a question that was typed in, and I think it would, now would be a good time to ask it since we're talking sure. about cultural competency. Mm-hmm. Uh, Katrina Wauer has asked, why do you think that Native American women are at such a high risk 
for HIV? Okay. I think there are a number of reasons that um, contribute to, I'm not sure I would say high risk, but their rates are high. Uh, And the rates, I think, are high for a couple of reasons, one of which is that Native women are ex- are exposed at risk because they're both on, my understanding is, and off reservation. Secondly, it's the same thing that drives risk in other in other women's groups, racial groups, and that is exposure to other sexually transmitted pathogens. And the third is it's a lot of this being able to access care, being comfortable in care. Can you disclose in care? What does care mean to you? I don't think... And again, I'm taking off my NIH hat, so you know I'm allergic to being unemployed. But I'll put on my I'll take off my NIH cap and put on my provider hat. I think that we have not been as responsive and attentive as we could be to what the unique constructs are that Native women need. And when you don't tend to that, this is what happens. Thank you. Okay. The second point is. Ongoing screening for intimate partner violence or other violence or mental health and substance use is absolutely essential. And a little bit further on the talk, I'm going to give you some quick tools. Many of you probably already have them that will allow you to do this. But screening still has to be done using tools that are appropriate. And then screening for violence certainly has to be done on an ongoing basis because the person's circumstances can change. And I do have three quick questions that have been shown to have a sensitivity in excess of 67% and a specificity, I believe, in excess of 80% that are good to pick up concerns about intimate partner violence. Um, I have a patient, for example, that was in a stable relationship for many years. Her care was quite good, and she was excellent about keeping her appointments. And then she began to fall off the map. Uh, initially, she said work was difficult and things were changing. I knew there were some issues with her mother. But the long and the short of it is that finally it all came to a head when I got a phone call from George Washington Hospital because she was being beaten by her partner. And she just was trying to cope with so many things. Just coming to care was just not on the radar screen right then. So that brings us to some quick screening for domestic violence. And, of course, we would not ask these questions in the presence of the alleged or suspected abuser. But again, these three questions, and this has been published by Feldhaus, and there's been an update, have a 65% sensitivity, but the the nice thing is the specificity, 84%. And they are basically these three. Have you been hit, kicked, punched, or otherwise hurt by someone within the past year, and if so, by whom? Do you feel safe in your current relationship? Is there a partner from a previous relationship who is making you feel unsafe now? I will tell you that I don't ask them in this order. My first question is always, do you feel safe in your current relationship slash situation? I start there. Because I don't want to start out with that first question because it almost presumes I'm expecting that that's what's going on. And to me, it feels more comfortable. I think however people feel comfortable doing it is important, but I definitely always ask about feeling safe, and I ask every time, and then I come around to the being hit, kicked, or punched. I can also tell you that the importance of this has been raised such that there are a number of trainings for primary care providers managing HIV patients, and Every single module that I've looked at that has to do with breaking the news and getting the patient to follow up includes a section on how to talk to the patient about being, are they at risk for intimate partner violence or experiencing intimate partner violence. Unfortunately, it doesn't end there because IPV has a lot of ripple effects. Now, we know that children who witness it and and are impacted by it and those who perpetrate it are also afflicted. They're more likely to have addictions, mental health disorders, and commit suicide. Uh, It's estimated that about one in four women in the United States will experience some uh, intimate partner violence in her lifetime. And just a reminder that abuse doesn't have to always be physical. It can be psychological. It can be economical. In Aisha, the patient that I presented to you, part of the reason for her weight loss was not just her illness, but her um, injection drug user boyfriend actually was not allowing her to access her food. He would actually physically prevent her from accessing food when he was present and at one point took to locking the, putting a lock on the refrigerator to coerce her into providing him with her money that she was receiving as part of her disability from her mental health illness. Um, 
people can be physically coerced. There can be appointments canceled. Uh, we had one patient whose diabetes was out of control, and it came out that her uh, boyfriend was forcing her to um, eat these high-calorie foods by saying he would beat her children if, if she didn't do this. And it just all came out one day when she came into the hospital for uh, ketoacidosis. Um, or sometimes a partner can just be there trying to, if you will, excuse me, suck up to the provider and saying, you know, well, she's really got these delusions and she's kind of ill and oh, I've stayed to try and help her out, completely undermining the victim's credibility. So why don't we stop here and just take a little bit of time to chat. If we could unmute the phones for a minute to talk about um, a little bit about partner violence and just issues in the patient's backgrounds that preclude linking and uh, coming into care. Because I see this, we've all, you know, we're all providers here to talk through this a little bit more. <coughs> Excuse me. All lines are open. Okay. This is Debbie Rock. Um, I, I, I wanted to go back and make a point on um, about facilitating linkages and sure. retention women into care. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of these are wonderful um, uh, points, but I think what could be added to it is the support groups that women um, need to find that are outside of the clinic setting sometimes that they feel that they're in a safe environment where they can go <coughs> on with other women. And not only that, bring to them that they do have um, – uh, life skills to talk about that I, I think one of my clients said 98% of her time is not spent in a clinic, maybe only 2%, and the rest of it she needs to get back to living. And so having uh, a facility or a safe environment that they can talk with others about how to go about doing that is, has been helpful. I think that's an absolutely excellent point, and um, you may be aware CDC has a number of um, evidence-based interventions, but some of those grew out of uh, interventions that were developed around support groups, um, mm -hmm. and there are also support groups that are and interventions designed just for women that are living with HIV infection, but you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, sometimes women have difficulty accessing that. It may not be available to them or they may, may not be proximate to where they are, but I couldn't agree more that, um, and, and I would say, when we talk about that support, it's also not just about managing their HIV infection and managing their lives, but also just about managing some of the complications that come along that, as providers, we might say, well, it goes in the mix, but for them it presents a new challenge. Like um, we have a group that we're trying to pull together for women who are trying to manage their diabetes, but, you know, it's not necessarily safe to walk in the neighborhood, but they've got to get some exercise, and who else is struggling with this? And it just opens up a lot of avenues for conversation. So I thank you for that because I really think that's important. Someone else? Also, just as a reminder, if you want to mute your phone, you would press star six. Anyone else have comments to make about the role of other things in this lives or about partner violence? Okay, then. I want to give people a chance to uh, chime in. Then I guess we'll go back to uh, muting the phones. All lines are muted. Thank you. So we've done that. Now let's take a look to the future because I think this is where... Um, we have some clear ideas of what's needed. I was fortunate to participate in a group that's published treatment adherence guidelines, or the first evidence-based treatment adherence guidelines we published in HIV infection. And it became very clear as you looked at the various population groups, there were big gaps. And in fact, one of the things that I'm the most proud of in that paper is that there's a table that for the population group, the gaps are listed. For women, the gaps were tremendous, and they're not the only group, but that's who we're talking about today. We really need evidence-based interventions that work to retain women in care. It was very difficult to find them. Uh, we need more research done that identifies what's the most cost-effective ways to improve adherence in women. And when I say cost-effective, I don't mean to imply that women's lives aren't important and we have to make sure we do it on the cheap. But let's be really clear 
the economy is difficult, funds are tight, and if we don't find ways to do it that are cost effective, it's then too easy to just opt out and say, well, we just can't do it at all. And we can't afford that. The risks and the the consequences are too great. We certainly need some standards for culturally and contextually relevant and directed care. I almost am uncomfortable at this point every time I will say culturally competent and culturally relevant because it's become almost a buzzword. But we do need some standards for that. What does it consist of? What does it look like? How do we do that? How has it become directed? Uh, we clearly need effective strategies for ways to offset some of the self-hatred and internalized homophobia and racism that some of our clients experience. We also have another direction, and I don't know how much people know about this, so I want to take just a few minutes as we wind down to talk about the fact that for the first time, yes, we are talking about that four-letter word, cure. There are a number of reasons why the NIH, as well as several other um, large research think tanks, are coming together to look at research on the cure. Number one, everyone has probably already heard of and maybe been sick of hearing about the Berlin patient, but it showed that it was possible through some interventions, in the case of the Berlin patient, providing antivirals and withholding them and then providing them and withdrawing them, what we call strategic treatment interruptions, to, in the case of this one patient, who was able to basically autoimmunize himself and has not yet recovered his viral replication. I would point out that we also have a Bethesda patient who was not published who has done the same thing and has been here at the NIH for several years being followed. Um, The second thing I will say is that we know because of really, as these things often happen, an experiment of nature, if you will, an individual with HIV infection who acquired a blood disorder which was malignant, a lymphoma, who required a bone marrow transplant and had an identical match. And in basically wiping out that individual's bone marrow, repopulating it with the identical donor match that was HIV negative, his HIV infection appears to have been completely eradicated. So because of that and because of much more complicated um, information that I won't get into at this point that has to do with what we can clear with the first couple of passes of antivirals, what remains in what we call the protected reservoir, and that the protected reservoirs include the brain, in male, the testis, in women, the ovaries, and other gentle areas, as well as certain lymphoid tissues. There appear to be ways to try and address that as our medications have become more sophisticated. So for the first time, the potential for this is real. There is a, a fair amount of Uh, progress in this area already. It's at the very, very basic science level, but these enhancements in our HIV therapies as well as immune-based vaccines, uh, the strong research there, as well as the fact we now have um, immune-based therapies, allows us to take a look at this and to consider it. So as I mentioned, between the bone marrow patient, our Bethesda patient, the Berlin patient, all this has come together. And the NIH does have a cure initiative. It's going to be headed by my chief, Dr. Jack Weitzcarver, and Dr. Francois Barret sinoussi who was the co-discoverer of HIV infection and for which she did receive the uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology. So that brings us full circle to my summary, and that is that Multiple factors clearly impact care linkage and engagement for women, and that these include all the social determinants of health, from poverty, violence, um, the social context, uh, even social network, which we really haven't touched on a great deal today. The entry and linkage into care begins with counseling and testing, and negative experiences at the outset adversely affect that. Alternatively, active referrals and supportive engagement enhance care engagement. Healthcare system navigating is a disincentive to many, and so peer navigators or treatment support has been demonstrated to be helpful. In fact, it's one of the few evidence-based interventions that we have. An established relationship with a provider um, that the client trusts and feels sees them as the whole person is routinely and consistently associated with greater retention and care. And consistent monitoring for troubles on the home front or in the personal life, including substance abuse, partner violence, and mental health issues, is really going to be important to help mitigate um, dropping out of care. One cannot 100% prevent it, but certainly can try to. 
And so I hope that I've been able to give you a little bit of a flavor for some of the tools that we need because you all do very important work. And so I would just leave you with a thought, you know, whose life will you touch and change today? Because I'm sure every day you all touch and change many lives. And so with that, I'll stop here, and I guess we can open it up for questions in general. I just want to thank you for your, for your time.